Uh, one of the main organizers of DEF CON, one of the largest hacker conventions in the world. I also run all the technical operations for the Black Hat security briefing. So I run the NOC for Black Hat. Um, I also help run the Security Operations Center for the RSA conference. Um, I'm on several review boards. I've written some books, blah, blah, blah. Um, those are all things that make my mom proud. Uh, but in reality, what they're supposed to um, demonstrate is that like, I love security. Like, I live and breathe security. Um, it's, it's nice to be able to do something that was once a hobby and have somebody pay me for it. It works out pretty well. So we're going to jump in. Um, so what, what threat hunting is, right? So I've got a nice shiny definition here. It says proactively searching through data in order to detect threats which have evaded traditional security measures. Um, and that's great if you're trying to explain what threat hunting is to somebody who's not part of our industry or doesn't understand what it is that you're trying to communicate to them. In reality, what we're doing is that we're doing IR before you know you're owned. It's a lot of the same practices, a lot of the same types of investigations. It's just before you know that an attacker is there or you have evidence that an attacker is there. Which means that sometimes hunting becomes incident response, right? If you go looking for an attacker, occasionally you will find one. And so you need to make sure that um, you think about those things, that when your hunters are going out and looking for stuff, they understand what the incident response policy is for your organization so that they know who to call, who to wake up, um, where to order the food from uh, for the late nights that you're about to be spending in your sock. Also, hunting is human driven, right? This is an analyst or group of analysts with a diverse skill set, hopefully, going out and looking for signs that an attacker is already persisting within the environment. This is not device driven. This is not another box that you can buy, despite what expo floors at Black Hat or RSA conference look like, where everyone's like, automate your hunt, automate your hunt. This is not something that you can automate. These are people. This is you sitting down and going and looking for attackers. It's proactive. That's the biggest thing about this, is that you are saying, I'm going to go look, and this is what I'm going to look for. So rather than waiting for some alert to come in, and then you saying, all right, this you know, box over here told me that this was bad. Let me go see if there's actually something bad there. We go and look for the things that we think, oh, OK. If we're going to get hit, this is likely where they're going to hit us. Let's go see if there's something about that. Um, it's iterative, right? This is a repeatable process. This is not random. It can feel random sometimes. You'll be going in, and you're clicking around, and you just think, like, well, now I'm going to click there, and I'm going to click here, and I'm going to click here. But you have to think about what it is that you're doing and why you're digging into those things. Because you may find something interesting and want to come back to that data later. So remember the path that you took to get there. What threat hunting is not, it's not just hitting Control F and looking for an IOC, right? Like, I talk to people all the time. They'll say, like, oh, we've got a threat hunting program. And in reality, what they're doing is ingesting a lot of threat intelligence. And then they go out and look for some IP address or a file hash or some host name. And they look throughout the environment for that thing. And if they don't see it, they're like, well, then we must be good. No, that's not hunting. That's Googling your, your network. Um, as I mentioned, it's not automated. This is not something where you click a button and say, go. However, when you're out there and you are hunting, you may find things that you think, oh, this is something that we could add to you know, our, our source solution later, right? Like something that will collect data for you. So it's also not new. The term is fairly new. It's relatively new to call it threat hunting versus um, stack counting in Excel, right? Like there are things, if you've ever been like, what are the most, uh, or what are all the domains that people have been going to in the environment? Let me throw them in an Excel, Excel spreadsheet, sort them, and see which ones are the, the outliers there. And that's what hunting is. This is a game of outliers. It's looking for why is that system you know, only accessing, it's the only box that accesses this website over here or, or pings out to this server over there. We want to know what that anomalous behavior leads to. It is also not wizardry. Um, it sounds cool, and having Threat Hunter on your business card sounds really cool, and people are like, what do you do? And you're like, I'm a hunter, right? It, like, it's, it seems like it's something sexy, but in reality, it's something that anyone can do. We all have different skill sets and different things that we're good at. We have those analyst biases that exist within ourselves. There's some sadist out there who just loves DNS, right? They love getting into the minutia of, a, of DNS. That's the person that you 
point at DNS and tell them hunt there. Or they're really good at a certain operating system. And so you say, hey, we're going to do some threat hunting on this operating system. Will you go out and look for it? So you don't need somebody who knows everything about everything. It's great if you have a generalist who's got an understanding of varied operating systems, different network protocols, the way that they all tie together. But it's not something you absolutely have to have. So if someone's like, oh, I don't have the skills to really get into threat hunting, don't limit yourself. Don't take yourself out of the game before you ever even start. Get in there and start hunting in the areas that you're the strongest. So why do we hunt? Well, we're hunting because we're trying to find previously undetected threats. And we're doing that because we want to reduce the dwell time that an attacker is persisting within our environment, right? So we've heard the stories where it's like, OK, you see a news story, and they say this company was breached. And it's like evidence shows that the, um, the hacker was in there for six months, or the hacker had been in there for a year. Um, the longest one that I've heard was seven years. There was enough log data going back that they were able to say that this system had been breached for seven years, and it was a US government system. It doesn't surprise me. Um, so um, that's what we're going out there to find, is find the attacker before they exfiltrate data or before they launch a ransomware campaign, whatever it is. Um, you can experience a breach, and it doesn't really feel like a breach until data leaves the environment. If you catch them before they take things away, Mm, you know, you can say, yeah, they got through some levels of our security, but it's, I wouldn't classify it like a, a breach breach. You won't end up on the news, at least. Um, and then why else are we hunting? Well, it helps us learn our environment. It's, this is probably the biggest return on investment or hidden return on investment of going out and hunting in your environment. You will learn it better than you ever have before. Because you'll start asking questions like, why do these systems communicate to one another? Why are they even allowed to communicate to one another? Why do we use these applications? Who decided that this was going to be part of the golden image that we push out to all of our hosts? Right? And you start to understand why IT made those choices. Right? Why did they say, oh, yeah, we're going to use this legacy protocol? Or why don't we encrypt these things? And when you start asking those questions, it, it's going to inform the rest of the security team as well. Um, but it also gives you an advantage over your attacker. Um, as somebody who spent many years on the offensive side of security, I can tell you that one of the first things you do when you breach a system for the first time is figure out what it is, what it does, what you have access to, how it connects to the rest of the organization, all of those things. So if the attacker is going to take the time to do that, maybe you should as well. It will also help you improve your overall organizational posture. And it does that by allowing you to go in and look around, and you'll start to identify gaps within your security. You'll say, hey, why are we not segmenting off this portion of the network over here from these folks over here? Or why are we using this legacy operating system on this system over here? And sometimes it's just people forgot. right? So we want to make sure that we're going out and identifying those potential gaps before an attacker finds them and ends up using it against us, right? So it's better if you find that legacy system. It's better if you find out that those areas aren't segmented before an attacker comes in and does that for you. Um, also, hunting just makes your analyst better. And frankly, it's just fun. I love it. Like, <laughs> it's super fun to go out and just start digging around and putting into practice all the things that we learn at places like this, right? We go to conferences, we read books, we attend classes, we do all of those things. But then we're often sitting behind a keyboard, taking a, a ticket out of a queue, going, well, this, we got an alert from whatever system XYZ. Is that something that's bad? No, it looks like our mitigation worked. Put in notes, go on to the next one, right? Analyst burnout is real. It's, um, so it's nice to be able to have time to sit down and go out and hunt for things and put into practice the knowledge that you have absorbed over the years. Um, a big part of hunting, you're going to hear me say this over and over again, is documenting things, right? Um, if we are out there and we're doing all these hunts, but we're not writing down what we're finding or why we decided to look in those places, we don't keep a record of it, then you know, it, it might as well have never happened. But we want to write down the types of things, because you're not going to find an attacker every time you go in. You shouldn't, right? That would be horrifying. But 
If you are in there and you're looking and you're not finding things, you still want to be able to find a way to communicate back to management that the time that you're spending doing the hunting was well spent. So we're going to write down things like what gaps we identified, right? Were there gaps in logging? Did we find a misconfiguration? Did we discover a vulnerability while we were in there? All of those things are not finding an attacker, which is the goal of hunting, but they are useful to the organization. It does provide value back. So we want to document those things, those gaps that we found, and then how we resolve them, right? Rather than just shouting out, this is a problem, who did you escalate that to? How did they follow up? Was that potential issue something that ended up being resolved? Because bringing down that risk is going to be incredibly valuable to the CISO. It's how you're going to get more time to hunt, more resources to hunt, better tools, those kind of things. So write it down, write it down, write it down. You're going to want to write down each hypothesis that you come up with when you're going out to do a hunt, right? So what made you want to go look somewhere? If you say, OK, well, if it was me and I was attacking our company, I would try to exfiltrate data from this portion of the network over here because I don't think we have eyes on that. OK, well, write that down. Why did you go look there? Why did you come to the conclusion that this was going to be a good place to look? And what did you find when you went and looked? What did you discover in that process? Um, any new alerts that you create, right? So we're talking about hunting. You don't use alerts to, to drive a hunt. But sometimes you'll find things that you're like, this is something we can use that will be alertable, right? We can go ahead and, and plug this in and hopefully get something back um, for that time that we spent going out and doing the hunt. So we want to look for, like, did we discover an IOC while we were doing it? Do we create new rules? Those kind of things. Make sure you write that down. And then lastly, of course, did you discover anything? Did you find an attacker? Was somebody already there? Um, was there a compromised host, right? Was there, what was it? What did you find on that, that hunt? These are all great, again, for getting you additional time to hunt, but it's also really nice at the end of the year when you have to do your performance evaluation and they say, what did you do? Like, what did you accomplish? You just give them all of this and you say, I found this many misconfigurations. I found this many vulnerabilities. I found an attacker in the environment. We had a legacy host and we went and got that fixed and I worked with these people to do that. Collaboration among the team, blah, 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 blah. Yay, give me my raise. Um, and so, Write this stuff down. It actually does matter. All right. Data sets. What are we going to use? Well, we want to collect our logs from key areas within the organization. And what do I mean by key areas? Everything. Literally everything. If you can log it, write it to disk. Storage is cheap, right? So dump it to disk. Now, maybe the SIM that you're using isn't necessarily cheap. So don't put it all into there. But Keep the logs, because even if you don't look at your logs, and please look at your logs, um, but even if you don't look at them, when you experience a breach of some kind or a declared incident where an attacker is actually coming after you and they have breached your defenses, being able to come back to the logs and say, what took place, what happened, and how far did they go back, when you have an incident response team that comes in to look at that stuff, they're going to be very, very excited about you having a log from everything that can possibly do it. But don't forget the network data, right? What are the ingress and egress points of your environment? Where does data come in and where does data leave? If you don't know what doors they're going in and out of, how can you put security around them, right? Um, how is the network carved up? How are things segmented? And then understand directionality. How is traffic flowing in our environment? Because sometimes a certain type of data flowing out isn't scary but the same kind of data coming in or a connection coming in on that same protocol can be very scary. So understand how data moves. Um, not every organization sticks with RSC 1918, right? So understand, like, OK, is this actually our internal network? Is this public? Where is that sending that? Um, and then I will say this one, I just think on a modern network and a modern SOC, having full packet capture is critical. Um, I liken full packet capture to video surveillance for your network. Logs are like me walking up to a door and I badge in and it said Grifter came in today at 8 a.m., um, which actually wouldn't happen. That's an anomaly. There's an outlier for you. I would not show up at 8 a.m. But if you went back and looked at the full packet capture of that or the video surveillance, you could say 
There's Grifter. He came in at this time. He was wearing a black hat and a black t-shirt. Um, he was carrying a box with him, and he had things in that box. And as he moved through the building, he was putting things in that place versus just a log that says he scanned in this door. 35 minutes later, he scanned in this door. Like, you're going to learn a lot more by being able to see everything that I do, and a full packet capture of the environment allows you to do that. Not only can you see everything that that individual on the network is doing, but you can see what they brought with them and what they took. So if they bring tools and they deploy those in the environment, you now have a full packet capture of that tool arriving. So you can pull that out of the stream, throw it in a sandbox, is it malware, detonate it, see what happens, right? So you can look and say, this is the tool, this is what they brought, this is what they're using. Also, if you're in the unfortunate scenario of having some of your data leave, so now you have exfiltration, when exfiltration takes place, you're able to say, these are the files that left. And the ability to go back and say, we know what left, and this is what it was, drastically changes your response. It drastically changes it from a legal standpoint, and again, from how you are perceived publicly, which is a big deal when you're talking about a breach, right? What's the public opinion of whether or not you did due diligence and made sure that your customers or uh, employees' data was safe? Well, you can say, hey, they only took this, they didn't get all this other stuff. And having full packet capture allows you to do that. But don't forget endpoint data. Um, everything that's endpoint related, endpoints where rubber meets the road, right? What took place in that, on that box, on that host? What did they touch? What processes were spawned? What files were moved? All of those things. Um, you know, you can see this list here, inventorying processes, schedule tasks, unexpected services, registry access. Those sound like incredibly foundational things, right? Well, there's a reason for that. They are incredibly foundational. But it is where we find the bad all the time. In the largest organizations in the world, we find the bad with incredibly foundational things. Because Attackers are going to use the path of least resistance. They're also not going to burn a zero day if they don't need to. If they hit a brick wall and hit a brick wall and they hit a brick wall, they will escalate their process. But if they can get in with something low hanging, they'll do that first. And if you're logging everything and you're capturing all your packets, you will see those attempts before they start to use the things you can't see. So do those. All right. Let's talk about the mindset um, of a hunter. So what we're really looking at when you're going in there and hunting is an exercise in situational awareness. It's understanding what normal looks like for your environment and then just diffing against that over and over and over again, looking for outliers. Did something change? Did we expect that to change? And if it didn't, why the hell did it change, right? Um, when you become intimately aware of what the norms are for your environment, the changes will stick out like a sore thumb. They will. They will stick out to you. You'll see it and you'll immediately go, that's not how that box normally works. Or we don't often communicate that way. So pay attention to that. Again, this is a game of outliers. But it is important to understand that even when you find an outlier, that doesn't necessarily mean you found evil. What it means is that you found an outlier. And if you have the right mindset, that will always be interesting because you start investigating that thing. And you may spend hours or even days doing an investigation on a hunt that led you to something that made the hair stand up in the back of your neck. And in the end, it turned out to be completely fine. But you learned something because you learned, oh, that's how these tools are deployed in our environment. That's how this system communicates. Or maybe it's on a protocol that you just didn't know that well, and now you've learned something else. So as long as you can put yourself in that mindset. Not always evil, always interesting. Leave your preconceived notions at the door. Um, don't start with IOCs. Start with a question. Again, this is the hypothesis, right? If data is leaving my environment, where's the most likely place it would leave? Or if it was me, how would I attack us and go look in those places? What tools would I use to attack us? This is where having some red team interest or past experience becomes really useful if you want to get into hunting. Knowing this is how I would hit us, let's go see if there's something there, um, can lead to some pretty interesting things. So. 
when you're out there and going and doing a hunt, what you want to do is know what you're looking for. Again, have that question to ask. Um, but don't be discouraged if or when you don't find something. Like, that's OK. Just move on to the next thing. Or if while you're doing that hunt, you think, this is what I want to go look for today, and as you start to go down that path, you see something that gets your attention, full stop. That's now what you're hunting. Make sure you go back to what your original hypothesis was, but if you're in the middle of a hunt and something gets your attention, go look at that. Why did that get your attention? There's a reason. Your gut is telling you something. Go and look. You're going to pivot a lot. Just be ready for that. You may be like, I'm going to look at this. I'm going to look at this. I'm going to look at this. Right? ADHD is really prevalent within our industry. Harness it. Use it. Um, <laughs> just make sure that you follow up on all of those things. Be like, I saw this, and this got my interest. This got my attention. This got my attention. Those are all additional potential places to hunt. And then find tools that help you make sense of all this data. It's a lot of data. It's a lot of stuff to carve through. It's not getting any smaller. This doesn't have to be something from a vendor. It can be something open source. There's plenty of tools that exist out there to help you with hunting, whether or not you pay a significant amount of money for it or you just spend time maintaining you know, something that's someone's project. Um, what is important is that they're the tools that your hunters like to use. So if you're on a hunt team and there are five of you, but four of you hate the tool that you're using, guess what? You are ineffective as a hunter because nobody wants to use that. It might be because it's slow. It doesn't output the data the way that people want it. So just find the tools that work for you and use those because that's how you're going to get results out of it. And then again, document it, document it, document it, and then share it. Do something like this. Get up on stage, talk to people. I like a thing. Let me tell you about the thing. Um, a lot of folks will question themselves. They'll be like, oh, if I went and looked for this, it's likely somebody else has already done that. Doesn't matter. Send a tweet, write a blog post, put out a white paper. Again, get up on stage and do a talk. Just share what you know, because even if you help one person avoid a breach, then you've made a difference. So document what you're doing and get out and share it. So what do we do? How do we figure out what the right questions to ask are? How do we start um, down that path to hunt? Well, what we want to do is look at our organization and say, what the hell am I protecting? Like, what am I doing all this for? What is all this money and effort and people? What's the goal here? Like, what is it that we're defending? down to your application and asset level. So understand, we're defending this, we're defending this, we're defending this. For those things, what are the likely attack vectors on those assets? And for those attack vectors, what are the techniques that somebody's going to use? And what are the artifacts that those techniques are going to leave behind? And then for those artifacts, what tools apply? And this is twofold. What tools create those artifacts? And what tools will help you discover those? Document it. <laughs> I said I was going to beat this one to death. Document it, document it, document it. And then red team and blue team it if you can. Um, I say this because what you're wanting to do is understand what are we defending and who's going to most likely come at us to attack that resource, that thing that we're defending in our organization. And once you understand who those folks are, Emulate their behavior and see if your hunters or your blue team can find that, right? You can go ahead and try to defend yourself against everything, but it's exhausting, right? If you're trying to make a huge dent in the risk for your organization, figure out who's most likely to come at you and figure out how they do that. So if you're in oil and gas, who attacks oil and gas companies? If you're in entertainment, who comes for entertainment? If you're in manufacturing, who's coming for manufacturing? Right? and figure out how they attack and where they're most likely to hit you, and go hunt there, and then emulate those attacks and see what you can come up with. And then do it over and over and over again. Hunting can be incredibly repetitive, but it's also incredibly rewarding. I don't know. I enjoy it. So where do we find some of that information? Right, 
of course, this wouldn't be a security talk without talking about MITRE ATT&CK, right? So go and look in MITRE ATT&CK. If you're a giant nerd like I am, sometimes if you have free time, just go in there and click through it. Go down the rabbit hole. Just read about different techniques and different things. It's a great resource, but it's a great resource of tactics, techniques, and procedures, the things that actually matter when we're talking about these groups that are going to be coming at us. How do they do business? And make no mistake about it, this is business, right? Whether it's organized crime or it's government or whatever it is, they've got a playbook, they've got a run book, they know what tools they like, and they use those. So go and figure out what they're going to use against an organization like your type, and that all exists in here. Another great thing about it is that you can take the information that exists in MITRE ATT&CK and create, essentially, you know, like a heat map of, can we see those things? Can, do we have visibility into those particular attacks or um, techniques? What data sources are we missing to find that? So if we're looking at something like, um, you know, web shells, it's like logs are OK, full packet capture is fantastic, Endpoint is fantastic. NetFlow is useless, right? But if you know that you're trying to defend yourself against you know, something that you have no, that you're like, oh, this particular technique, we're, we don't have full packet capture, so we're not going to be able to find you know, exfiltration as easily with just logs or whatever, right? We're, so you can take that, run it up to um, your leadership and say, hey, here are all the areas that we are the most likely to be attacked. Here are the data sources that we have that cover those areas. I am missing visibility into this type of attack, this type of attack, and this type of attack. And this group that's very interested in organizations like ours is going to probably hit us with that. So can I have more budget to go buy those things so I get more visibility? And two things will happen here. One, you'll either get the budget or you won't. And if you don't, that's OK, too. You have your heat map, your little you know, stoplight type of uh, chart set up here. So when a breach does happen, and you can say, all right, this is how the attacker hit us, and they call in the CISO, right? But now you're not the chief information security officer. You're the chief information scapegoat officer. Heads have to roll, and it's the CISO whose head is going to roll. They can point to this and say, yeah, they hit us with this type of attack. If you remember, back in March, I told you that we were blind to this type of attack. I asked for more funding to be able to, to protect against that. But you said no. So I'm going to go back to my desk, and you, you go talk to the board, and then you go back to your desk, and you keep your job. So. so I mentioned Red Team, so I'll make a quick um, just distinguish the difference between the things that we're talking about um, when we talk about offensive services or technologies or approaches to things. Um, a vulnerability scan is just software that you're deploying, and you click a button, and it goes. And then it goes, and it delivers a bunch of stuff and says, hey, I found these vulnerabilities, um, and gives you a report. You can even put a little logo in there. That's nice. And some companies say that they're doing pen testing, when in reality, they're just doing a vulnerability scan, and then they put your logo on it, and they sell it to you for 10 grand, right? It's absurd. What a pen test actually is is you. It's a person sitting in a seat doing an actual you know, job. Um, someone with skills who goes out, tries to find as many vulnerabilities as they can. When they found those vulnerabilities, they see if they can exploit them. If they can, they mark that down. And it's a numbers game. You try to find as many and get as deep as you can in as many areas as you can. Right? So a pen test is going to be broad, hopefully broad scope, big sweep, try to find as much as we can. Um, but that's not red teaming. Red teaming, or, or adversary simulation or emulation, is a test of not just the technology that you have in your environment, but also of your defensive team, of the folks who are in there defending the environment. What a red team should be doing is taking the threat intelligence, like those TTPs, the tactics, techniques, and procedures, of the groups who are most likely to attack you, and going out and doing those, and seeing if your blue team can detect it, seeing if your hunters find evidence of those things, right? We're simulating what an adversary is going to do. They should have a goal, and they should 
go and try to achieve that goal, um, this is not just wild west crazy going, trying to find everything that they can. Um, and then just a note here uh, from the gospel according to Grifter is the findings that a red team has should be something that is shared with the organization and with the blue team without it being like discipline, right? The, the defenders shouldn't get in trouble for the things that the red team finds. Their whole job is to get past no matter what you set up, and they're really good at it. It shouldn't become adversarial. It should be something where it's about sitting down and saying, look, we know that you did all of these things, but you just, like, we were able to get through here, and we were able to get through here, and then sitting down and being like, here's our suggestion on how to keep us out of that next time. Not just like, ha ha, gotcha, like, those, like that kind of bullshit makes me crazy. Um, and then I threw this in here as well, just bug bounty programs. Uh, they can be a great low cost um, form of testing, but they can also create a lot of noise. Sometimes you're like, oh, I don't know if somebody's hitting that application because they're, doing a, they're just checking on a bug bounty or if that is actually somebody who's hitting us. So just be aware of that. All right, let's talk about practical hunting, things to actually go out and do. The thing that's important to think about is that, again, a lot of the things that we're going to talk about are either foundational or they're alertable, but what we're talking about is a layer of these things. So if I go out and look, if I look at web traffic coming into the organization and I see that it is coming from a region we don't normally do business with, maybe that's not that big of a deal. But if I also see that the content length is mis uh, mismatched from what it um, should be, well, that's another red flag that puts, you know, gets my back up a little bit more. And now I notice that there are, there's a really short user agent string in there, but I'm expecting a lot more information. Then, okay, well, that's a little bit more. So a lot of these things, again, layers increase the amount of um, spookiness of, <laughs> of those um, findings. So what you want to do, Check your logs um, for process creation, right? That's great. Don't you, if you alerted on process creation, we just, we just all quit, right? You can't do that. Um, but be aware of what those processes are mapped to, right? What are the process names that are normal for the environment? And does that match the allowed software for the organization, right? Is this something that we normally use? Um, if you have the ability, I know this is a larger ask, but verify that the file hashes match known good executables. So do those, has that executable been modified? What I will do for something like this, and this also holds true a bit for networking as well, is I'll take a 24 hour time period and I'll look at all of the processes executed across the environment for that 24 hours. This could be 10,000 machines, it could be 100,000 machines. But if you're looking at 10,000 machines, and only four of them have a certain process running on them. It's that, that process only runs on four machines. What the hell is that process? And why is it there? Is that malware? Is that something that's sitting there that we don't know exists? Or is it just normal for those four machines? If it's normal, add it to your allow list and move along. But why is that happening, right? Again, game of outliers. Um, we've all done this. You ever just like open up your task manager in Windows or whatever, you look at the processes and then you see something you don't recognize and you just go, shit, <laughs> like what is that? And you're like, damn, and you start, start Googling it. What is that process, right? You, now that you've looked and you've seen this has made me a little scared, what does the Google search turn up? If that doesn't give you enough to make you feel better, you take a file hash and you go look in VirusTotal. You still feel a little wonky about it, you grab the executable, you throw it in a sandbox, and you take a look. So the same things you would do normal for your machine at home, you're just doing that on an organizational scale. And then maybe you want to use automation to deliver you a report of what those outlier processes are. Again, automation won't do the hunting for you, but it can assist you in doing the hunting. Right? We want to look for parent and process relationships, like the, well, if you see command.exe running from Winword, that's, that's not normal. You might want to check into that. Um, do we have PowerShell making outbound connections? Like things, again, outliers. This is not something that's normal. Let's go ahead and, and dig into that. SVC host being launched by anything other than services.exe. Uh, processes missing company name or product versions. 
Sometimes it's a lazy developer. Sometimes it's a lazy attacker. Um, again, it seems foundational, but we have found things in major organizations where it's just something like this that keys someone in and says, it's just, there's no, this information is missing. Look for processes that have similar names to legitimate processes, right? This is where they've you know, changed a character or added an additional one. It looks like it's something that should be legit, but it's not. Um, doing a string similarity algorithm here can be useful, especially when you're using large data sets. Go ahead and say, does this look close to these processes that I have? Um, it's super helpful. And then processes starting from odd locations is another one where it's just, does it ever launch from there? If it shouldn't launch from there, let's go take a look. Um, scripting, another one where it's like, am I really going to go and look for everybody that's using any kind of scripting in the environment? Sure. C script, W script, PowerShell. Who's using PowerShell across the organization? It, why the hell is Brian from finance using PowerShell? Maybe Brian has a really good reason for using PowerShell. Add Brian to the allow list and move on. But who is doing scripting in the environment? And when you've added everybody to that allow list and suddenly, you know, um, somebody that should never, ever, or has never touched PowerShell before starts using it, that should set off alarm bells for you that this is something we need to go and take a look at. Um, are they using encoded commands? Why? Why are they invoking encoded command? Why are they trying to hide what commands they're running? Um, and then use naming convention for scripts. Again, just advice from me. Um, set up a naming convention. I know that sometimes it's difficult, especially if you're going backwards with an organization you're coming into and then you're saying, hey, we should really go back and rename all these things this. But it allows you to then alert on when something is outside of a naming convention. It makes it easy to find stuff that shows up out of the blue. Um, this is a no-brainer here, but users being added into privileged groups. So no one IT normally does that. When do they normally add people to that group? If that process doesn't exist, if they're not like, oh, we normally make changes to groups or privileged groups like every Monday and Wednesday, and that happens on Thursday or Friday, you should know about that, right? Like, if that process doesn't exist, put it into place. It's useful. It helps. Um, collecting your bash history to a central location. I know this seems a little weird, bash history, but watching somebody at a command line not only tells you what it is that they're looking for, but it also kind of gives you an indication of the skill of that individual. If you've ever watched over somebody's shoulder, you know what it's like when you see someone just fly through the command line, and you're like, damn, it's impressive as hell. Versus when somebody's watching over your shoulder and you can't type anything right ever, right, while they're doing it, and you're like, I swear I'm better than this. Um, but if you're looking at, you know, the bash history, you can understand, hey, this is something that this individual is trying to do, or I can say when I was on the attacker side of the house or the offensive side of the house, if I got into a machine, I would often look at the bash history myself because it gave me an indication of what that machine was used for, right? Um, look for signs of internal reconnaissance, right? Things like who am I, IP config, user account, stuff like that. Again, that normally Brian and finance isn't doing, but suddenly those commands are being run on machines that don't do that. Why? Well, let's go dig into that machine and see what else is going on. Or things that shouldn't be run at all. Who's, why is Brian suddenly interested in Nmap, right? Anything that you would see on a Kali distro, basically. So um, look for signs of lateral movement. This is a new user endpoint pair. So somebody who logs into a box that they've never logged into before. Why are those credentials being used for the first time on a system that they've never touched? Maybe somebody got moved to a different part of the organization. Maybe they got assigned to a project that now they're going to have to access something else. But why are they doing it? Find out. It's an outlier. Go and look. And new endpoint to endpoint pairs. If suddenly one server that's never talked to another server in the organization starts talking to it like finance starts communicating with research and development and suddenly there's data flowing between those and it's never happened before, what changed? Why are those systems talking to each other? And another one is just a user 
logging in, and then immediately using a different set of credentials to access something else. This may be normal behavior for someone in IT, but it's not normal behavior for Brian in finance. Um, so, yeah. And then, of course, the uh, standard, any, any signs of log tampering at all, any corrupted or cleared logs, like what, what's somebody trying to hide? Look for signs of persistence, right? Changes to the registry. This is good not just for is somebody going there and changing stuff, but we've also found where somebody has made changes to a device that they have because they were given the wrong, they were put into the wrong group when they were brought onto the company or whatever, right? They were given admin rights that shouldn't exist for that machine. It seems like something simple and it's housekeeping type of things, but if that machine got breached and it has this higher set of, of um, you know, permissions than it should, then that could potentially be a great jumping off point to other areas. So it allows you to find things like that. Um, look for scheduled task creations or, or changes or a disabling of different tasks. Again, foundational stuff, but we find bad all the time with this. Look for unknown or unapproved services. Um, the indicator, so nice, I named it twice. Users being added to privileged groups are also a sign of persistence, somebody trying to stay sticky. And then this one may seem a little odd, but you can get hints from your antivirus, right? If you're seeing a file being cleaned from a download folder, that's probably fine. But if you're seeing something that's being cleaned from System32, how did it land in System32? How did it get there? Where was it before there? So if users are downloading something and it's immediately killed by antivirus, great, it's doing what it's supposed to be doing. But if it's landing somewhere else, go find out why. Um, and of course, if you see any type of attack tools that are being cleaned in your antivirus logs, why did Brian in finance try to download Mimi Cats? Like, what was he doing, right? So go look for those types of things. Um, and look for droppers, you know, stuff that precedes sophisticated deployments. Um, look for artifacts in, in shim cache and am cache, right? This is going to tell you what your applications are doing in the environment. If you're not hunting in shim cache and am cache, you are missing things, I promise. Go and look. Look for renamed tools, somebody who's deployed tools in the environment, but they're just renaming them so it's not showing up the way you think it should. And you can look for things like that by looking at command line arguments and saying, well, that looks an awful lot like port forwarding and putty because of the way that the command structure is set up. Um, when it comes to web, like look for things like posts with no get, short file name scripts, things where like somebody just puts a dot, you know, PHP or something like that, like whatever. When somebody's deploying something, they may just throw it in there. Look for laziness. Laziness finds attackers. Um, encoded query strings, what are they trying to hide, right? There's a blob of base64 in your URL, what the hell is that? Right? Go look for it. Low numbers of HTTP headers. So anything six or less, you want to take a look at. You want to see things like content length. You, know, you want to see what their user agent string is. It tells them how they're going to format things for that environment. Um, so go and look for it. I know this one sounds crazy, but direct to IP. We have found very bad things just by saying, hey, that's communicating direct to an IP address rather than a host name. So go look for that. And then specifying a port number, right? We do this all the time because we're like, oh, that server is communicating on this port. But you know who's never done that? My dad. My dad's never typed a port number into a URL. Never. I would I'd bet any amount of money on it. Um, stranger missing referrers. Where are those people coming from? Again, I mentioned content length earlier. This is an RFC standard. So if, the, if content length is missing or it's mismatched, why is that? That breaks the RFC. Old, strange, or short user agent strings. User agent strings telling you how the format of that website is going to be for that operating system. Uh, and if it's super old, like it says Mozilla, or it says Mozilla 5, but there's nothing after that, that's not normal. So go look, why is this happening? Um, in DNS, look for dynamic DNS. It's used all the time for command and control. Um, and then we also just find people communicating to their file servers at home, you know, spending time looking, uh, setting up things that shouldn't be there. They're policy violations. They're not necessarily bad. But again, we're talking about risk reduction. So just look for that. Signs of, of DGA or domain generation algorithms. 
We hunt for this normally by looking for four consecutive consonants, which works unless you're, um, we used to use three, but we tripped over the Polish language a lot, so it's four. <laughs> Look for signs of somebody communicating to dot .onion addresses. Um, this can be an indicator sometimes, uh, your first indicator that somebody's being affected by ransomware. They're using another machine, trying to figure out how to go to a site to look up what they have to do to pay the ransom. Go look for that. Um, DNS tunneling, a large number of subdomains. This is somebody exfiltrating really uh, um, data out of the environment, but really slowly. It's only a couple bytes of data, but they do it over and over and over again, and eventually they get the thing that they want if you're not looking. Um, a large number of a single subdomain is, again, command and control. We'll see this a lot. Um, so look for things like that. High volumes of null and text records. We can move data out. It's a little more bandwidth than what we're talking about with a large number of subdomains. Go and look and see what's inside those records. Um, and then sometimes just straight up file transfer over DNS, right? Somebody's just trying to move the file out. Um, go and look for those things and see um, what it is that they're moving. Sometimes it, you'll trip over a zone transfer or even like a, antivirus vendors know how to do <laughs> file transfer over DNS and they want to get sample files out and they'll use this. So you think this is somebody exfiltrating and really it's just Sophos. Um, and lastly, encrypted traffic. What do we do about encrypted traffic? Well, metadata is still has value. We don't just dump it. People think, oh, we don't log anything, don't do whatever. The metadata involved in encrypted traffic allows you to understand where that is going, source and destination, session sizes, allow you to infer different things about whether or not they were uploading or downloading data. There's stuff that you can gain from looking at the metadata in encrypted traffic. Um, or JAW 3, giving you higher confidence on what the applications are that are being used in that environment. Um, but in reality, if you're not doing decryption, it's time to start doing decryption. Um, we're seeing, and even on the Black Hat network, we see roughly 70 to 80% encrypted traffic. And if you are not seeing into 70 to 80% of your traffic at home or, or in your um, home environments, your, your corporate environments, you are missing things. And even if your security tool tells you that you have to just check a box and it will start decrypting things for you, it's just trying, don't do that. Get a standalone solution. Don't trust the tool to do it for you because likely that's just a vendor trying to sell you a little bit more. And that's it. Thanks. I'll be around. I don't have time for questions, I, but, um, but yeah, I'll be kicking around. If you have any questions, hit me up outside. Est-ce que quelqu'un a une question? Et dans ce cas-là, il faut se lever et lever son bras. Quelqu'un peut aller donner un micro Hello, uh, Michel. Oh, sure, I can do that. Say I saw in a medium-sized company. Uh, first, we have a Brian in the room. You so have a Brian. Brian. Yes, Where are yes. You? Brian, damn it. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you didn't talk about certificates. And in my own experience, when we do uh, web scanning, we have a lot of information to exploit in the certificates because we have a uh, Original certificate, certificate issued by companies that we don't use normally, right. or internal, or not common uh, duration, and so on. So I think it's one stuff to look, which is All very right, important. So, so good point. He's saying something I need to add is more about hunting and certificates and stuff. I'll add that to the next time I do it. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate it. Is there? Like, am I completely out of time, or can I tell them a story? Yeah, we'll have to All right. All right, we're good. So, thank you very much, Grifter. Thanks. <laughs>